Good evening. Um, I wanted to get on stage in time to say thank you to the wonderful uh, musicians. Uh, just one more round of applause for them. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Richard Black. I'm Pro Director for Research and Enterprise here at SOAS, and it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you to uh, this evening's uh, first inaugural lecture of the year on behalf of uh, Baroness Valerie Amos, who can't be here as she's in America uh, this week. Um, and indeed, it's not just the first inaugural lecture of the year, it's the first inaugural lecture for two years, because we took a pause on our inaugural lectures last year for our centenary celebrations. And tonight is a celebration. It's a celebration not only of uh, Shane McCausland's promotion to uh, chair, but also a celebration of our relationship with the Percival David Foundation for Chinese Art. Uh, Shane, as you may be aware, is the latest holder of the Percival David Chair at SOAS, which goes back, I believe, to before the Second World War, had its origins originally in a course funded by Sir Percival David uh, back in the 1930s at SOAS, um, and then a lectureship that was set up in his name uh, with a grant from the then University's Grants Commission. Uh, those were the days when you could get a lectureship in Chinese art from the University's Grants Commission. For much of that period, SOAS was proud to hold the uh, Percival David's wonderful collection of ceramics um, one of the most important collections in the world, certainly outside China. As you're, I'm sure, aware, that collection is now in the British Museum, where a significant proportion of the museum's 7 million annual visitors are able to see it free of charge. Um, as some of you may be aware, in the 10 years since the collection went to the museum, there have been a series of complex negotiations between the Foundation, the University of London, and so as, um, but I'm extremely proud to say uh, that this week we have signed a new agreement with the foundation that secures the long-term loan of Sir Percival's library and his study collection and also the Sparks archive uh, for SOAS. Uh, the library and the archive are already in the process of being catalogued and accessed to the school's collections and will hopefully be available to generations of students and scholars from about the end of 2018. It takes a little while to access a collection. We've also started active use of the Lady David Gallery in Gordon Square for our new modules on museum creation in the School of Arts. Now, my primary function tonight, apart from telling you that wonderful news, is to uh, do a couple of things. First of all, I have to tell you where the emergency exits are, so they are there and there. Uh, there is no fire drill uh, uh, planned for tonight's uh, lecture, so if you hear a fire alarm, that does mean that you need to leave. Um, I'd like to invite you to stay on after the lecture uh, for drinks in the Brunei Gallery, uh, and Shane will say a bit more about that. I'd like to invite you to switch your mobile phones to silent, uh, but please keep them in your hands and tweet throughout the lecture. <laughs> um, and then finally, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, two uh, external guests of great distinction who will respectively introduce Shane and propose a vote of thanks. And I will uh, introduce them very quickly because you don't want to listen too long to me, but we're very pleased to welcome Professor Dr. Sarah Fraser, who will introduce Shane. Um, Sarah holds the chair in East Asian Art and serves as Vice Director of the Institute for East Asia Art History at Heidelberg University. And prior to going to Germany, she was Professor and Department Chair at Northwestern University in Chicago. Sarah leads a consortium of European, Chinese, and American universities and a Getty Foundation-sponsored initiative focused on Chinese artists trained in London. Uh, Paris and Berlin during the 1920s and 1940s, and her books include uh, Performing the Visual, Merit, Opulence, and the Buddhist Network of Wealth, and more recently Cross Media Women, and Su Bing after Book from the Sky. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And then, uh, and then we'll hear uh, Shane, and then finally at the end we will have a vote of thanks from Professor Craig Clunas, 
Um, Craig is particularly um, apposite to welcome to give the vote of thanks as he was the previous Percival David Professor of Chinese Art at SOAS uh, before moving to his current post at the University of Oxford. And Craig has published extensively, as I'm sure you're aware, on art history and the culture of China, much of it concentrating on the Ming period. Uh, before SOAS, he worked at the University of London, so we are kind of following each other across the country. In fact, I'm following um, Craig rather than the other way around. He's author of Art in China in the Oxford History of Art series, uh, and among six other books, uh, he most recently published Screen of Kings, Art and Royal Power in Ming China. And uh, I also realize today that he is currently the visiting Gresham Professor of Chinese Art. So over the course of this year, if you wish, you have two more opportunities to hear uh, Craig speak in London. So thank you very much to Sarah and Craig for being the bread to tonight's Shane sandwich. And thank you all for coming, and I will now hand over to Sarah. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you very much, uh, Director Black. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you a colleague collaborator and friend, Professor Shane McCausland this evening. And I would like to take you through uh, some of the highlights of his distinguished career and provide some sense of his work in, um, and how it's situated in the larger field of Chinese art history. It is certainly a cause for celebration that there is a chair for Chinese art at the University of London and that the legacy of Sir Percival David continues into the 21st century in such a dynamic fashion here at SOAS and in the extremely capable hands of Shane. David's collection of 1700 or more than 1700 imperial porcelain was acquired, as we know, almost one century ago. These magnificent objects are now housed, as we've uh, just uh, been reprised of this history, just around the corner in the British Museum and are still within easy reach for students. But many of Professor Shane McCausland's important publications also draw expertly on the Chinese paintings in the British Museum, which left China just around the same time as the Percival David collection of porcelain that is during the final years of the Qing court, or just after the dynastic period ended in 1911. And Shane has paid special attention to excavating the importance of the, the encounters during the first decades of the 20th century and how the history of collecting, particularly from imperial holdings, has shaped our understanding of Chinese material culture and perceptions of Chinese art abroad. In these liminal moments between empire and republic, Pui, the former emperor, enjoyed unique access to the palace's storehouse of painting and calligraphy, and his British tutor entertained him with modern gifts such as cameras and uh, uh, telescopes and the like. And the non-sovereign monarch gifted him objects from the palace household, two of which are held in SOAS. And today, during Shane's fascinating in-depth lecture, we will learn more about these objects and how they circulated in a complex network of gift giving. And this is one of the strengths of Professor McCausland's um, uh, trajectory of research, is to think about the circulation of objects. This is the same period of time when the Dunhuang paintings entered the British Museum's collection, and of course, the admonitions of the court instructress, which many of us know in detail now through the research and conferences organized by Shane, who has dedicated a great deal of his attention elucidating this remarkable scroll. His 2003 publication, produced jointly by the Percival David Foundation and the British Museum, joined scholars from the PRC, Taiwan, Europe, the UK, and all the schools of Chinese painting studies in the US. And I'm gonna say something more about that in a minute, but back to this volume, just to point out it is a singular contribution to the field, a Bible, um, uh, so to speak, on the painting, or this painting, the Amunditions, um, and uh, something of its history. It's a palimpsest of all the connoisseurs who touched it and the, uh, the relationship across uh, more than a millennium 
um, and the relationships between um, uh, those who enjoyed it and uh, circulated it um, uh, across uh, the uh, dynasties. After receiving his BA and MA with honors at Cambridge University, Shane pursued his doctoral studies at Princeton. And by all means of reckoning, we, Shane and myself, uh, by virtue of where we studied and with whom, we each represent uh, the distinct uh, scholarly divide or division in Chinese art history in the use uh, or um, the history in the US that marked the last quarter of the 20th century. Shane, the East Coast, Yale, Princeton School maintained by Wen Fong and Richard Barnhart, and I, the West Coast Berkeley School, uh, at whose helm uh, James Cahill presided. And this long-standing, simmering feud about attributions and connoisseurship probably doesn't matter anymore these days, but it did uh, matter for a long time, and uh, even just a decade ago, um, it uh, infused uh, many of conferences and uh, impacted the field. Actually, before participating today, I probably, come to think of it, should have asked Shane where he stands on the riverbank controversy. <laughs> Zhang Dachen or not Zhang Dachen, uh, and uh, something in between uh, Dong Yuan or not. But in all seriousness, thinking about the future of the field, Shane dedicates himself to a wide range of questions and problems. And those of you who don't know those inside jokes about uh, the riverbank, are probably wondering what it's about, and honestly, it may not be uh, uh, much about anything. <laughs> but uh, these earlier divides in the field seem less important, especially in light of um, much recent scholarship. Yes, attributions and uh, connoisseurship are critical if we're going to continue to expand the canon and include a greater range of objects that we investigate in our research. Equally important, Shane's work continues to draw our attention to how objects circulated in the modern period and earlier. This parallel history is exciting and compelling. It doesn't replace questions of style, and it deepens um, the discussion. Um, and there are so many other objects beyond paintings held in major museums. And examples of how Shane's inquiries bring our attention outward includes his uh, it, deepening study of contemporary paintings, such as the Hongling exhibition that he curated here in the Brunei Gallery last fall. And we look forward to um, more um, work in contemporary painting in his hands. For this reason, Shane has developed and maintained a broad network of scholars and museum professionals across the globe, and he has the right public profile to draw attention to the rich holdings here at SOAS and to reach a broad public audience through the Brunei Gallery. His two plus, uh, uh, two plus decades affiliated with museums and libraries means that we can look forward to an exciting mix of scholarship and curatorial projects that bring luster to this institution. His gift for collegial networking and his administrative genius has translated into a fruitful, ongoing collaboration with our institute, the Institute for Kunstgeschichte aus Asiens at Heidelberg University. We are supported under the banner of the Connecting Art Histories initiative from the Getty Foundation in Los Angeles. And this summer, we were based here at SOAS in a project focused on early 20th century Chinese artists who trained in Europe. And this winter, we will decamp to Paris. But in the next few years, Shane will uh, come to Germany, and we will welcome in, him in Heidelberg for a series of doctoral dissertation workshops on Chinese art for graduate students. It is, it is his gracious collegial spirit and his rigorous scholarly training, evidenced by his beautiful writing and numerous awards that make him the ideal academic partner. And it is on this note that I'm delighted to present to you today uh, Perci the Percival David Chair of Chinese Art, Professor Shane McCausland, whose lecture today is entitled The Art of Quitting Court, The Last Emperor of China's Parting Gifts. Thank you. Pro-Director, distinguished colleagues and guests, ladies and gentlemen. 
Exploring the theme of commemoration in SOAS's Chinese collections for the centenary show last summer, I mulled over the role of artworks as keepers of memory and agents of institutional vision. And tonight's lecture grew out of my puzzling about two particular mementos, an album and a fan given respectively in 1926 and 1930 by the last emperor of China, Ai Xin Joro Henry Pu Yi, 1906 to 1967, to Reginald Johnston, 1874 to 1938, his English tutor. The fan is inscribed by Pu Yi, who had been deposed aged five after the Qing dynasty fell in 1911, with two ancient poems about leaving and dedicated to tutor Johnston, uh, which you can see in the upper right. On the flyleaf of the album, the inscription in English, upper left here, reads, to Mr. Johnston from the Manchu Emperor. And this may be Johnston's rendering of Pu Yi's dedication in Chinese to the right, which says, the year Bing Yin, fifth month, 27th day, as our teacher Zhuang Shidun returns to his country, we gift this as a memento imperially inscribed by the Xuantong Emperor. Now, Johnson and Pui are, of course, well known to modern audiences from Bernardo Bertolucci's 1987 bio epic, The Last Emperor. But it's less widely known that in 1931, after his final return from China to the UK and his knighthood, Johnston became professor of Chinese at the then School of Oriental Studies. And although Sir Reginald did not care for teaching at SOAS, his collections have ended up here, some in 1935 and others after his death via his fiancée, Mrs. Elizabeth Sparshot, and the Sir Percival David Foundation of Chinese Art. So the album and the fan are now formally reunited in SOAS Library following the signing of the SOAS PDF Library Loan Agreement, which we celebrate tonight. And in this regard, I should like to thank, uh, for, for his generous support uh, for tonight's event, SOAS Pro Director, Professor Richard Black, and uh, also the Percival David Foundation, in particular its chairman, Colin Sheaf. And I also wish to record my respect and admiration for the late Paul Webley, former director of SOAS, who offered me the chair in 2005. And I'm honored that Professor Sarah Fraser and Craig Clunas have considered it important to come from Heidelberg and from Oxford tonight to top and tail my inaugural lecture as the Percival David Professor of the History of Art at SOAS. Now I say the fan and the album are in SOAS library, but that's not quite right. By kind arrangement of my colleagues in the library, the Brunei Gallery, and events, including Christine Wise, John Hollingworth, Gion Wood, and especially Payal Gaglani Bat and Tom White, whose sterling efforts have made this evening possible, they are in fact mounted together in a temporary display in the Brunei Gallery for tonight only, where you'll be able to view them afterwards during the reception. I had so many questions about these parting gifts. How could they be both personally commemorative and yet majestic and royal, matched in value to the occasion and the recipient, and also embodiments of ideals and values of the court. What help with his choices did Pu Yi have from advisors skilled in art and connoisseurship? The fiction of Pu Yi still being the Xuantong Emperor of the Manchu Qing Dynasty, 1644 to 1911, as donor of both objects, and the proficient quality of the album, suggest that these are examples of those carefully graded compliments which we imagine well-schooled royals instinctively know how to give. But just how were such things calibrated in early Republican China? For Pu Yi, such artworks were his wherewithal and his currency. But imperial gifting was also a long-time convention in China, including for gifts bestowed upon meritorious courtiers leaving court like Johnson. So what were the optics of quitting court in the 1920s? Johnson's tutelage of Pu Yi had officially lasted from 1919, when the 13-year-old was still closeted with his family in the Forbidden City, to 1924, when, as an 18-year-old, he was expelled. 
But Johnston continued to advise him off and on during the rocky years under Japanese protection in Beijing and in Tianjin from 1925 to 1931. I did wonder in particular, how did the formal choice of this early Qing Dynasty album of flowers speak to Johnson and Pu Yi's relationship on the occasion of the ex-tutor's return to Britain in July 1926? And I quickly realized that this was just one of several instances of quitting court between 1924 and 1931, all commemorated in some way in art. So the album presented in July 1926 was the first parting gift, but Johnston unexpectedly kept, kept returning to China, the first time from 1927 to 1930 as the British commissioner at Wei Highway, and he paid uh, several visits to Pui. On the last occasion, Pui hinted that his exile in Tianjin would soon come to an end, and he presented Johnston with this fan, which is upstairs, uh, as is shown in The Last Emperor. You actually see the fan being presented. Johnston returned again the following year, again unexpectedly, this time for a conference, but also on business to do with the Boxer Indemnity. That's the, the funding that funded the university's China's commi China Committee, which originally funded the uh, Percival David Chair. It doesn't now, uh, but it once did. These were what would be his last meetings with Pu Yi, and this time, Johnston secured the preface to the memoir that he had begun, which would appear in 1934, entitled Twilight in the Forbidden City. Uh, this very polished calligraphy is not by Pu Yi, but it's by his trusted advisor, Zheng Xiaoxu, um, of whom I'll speak quite a bit more later. There's one other instance of quitting court which overshadows all of these examples, and that's Pu Yi's own desperate escape across Beijing in 1924 into Japanese protection. Now, that event uh, during a dust storm was commemorated by the inner circle of courtiers in a little noticed picture scroll uh, from perhaps 1925, reproduced in Twilight. Now, uncovering the art historical situation of these various works has been a bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle. Some areas have been trickier than others, but most of it needs to be pieced together before you start to get the fuller picture. And so what I present tonight are going to be vignettes from a longer paper focusing mainly on the paintings. Let's begin then with the album. Each of the 10 leaves bears an inscribed flower painting by a scholar artist, Chen Shu, uh, who was active in Nanjing in the early decades of the Qing Dynasty, that's the 1650s to 1680s. And the flowers comprise peonies and pomegranate, lily and chrysanthemum, mostly paired with poetic couplets, composed and transcribed by the artist in an aesthetic rather than a seasonal grouping of nature, uh, popular, popularized by the spiritual patron of this kind of ink miscellany, uh, the unconventional Ming artist Xu Wei. For comparison, I show you uh, a pomegranate by Xu Wei, uh, which exemplifies this so-called sketch conceptualist mode. It shows a very similar preoccupation with um, iconic shading and silhouetting and the full array of brush textures in, and ink tones. Now the album has some successful, if slightly repetitive arrangements you see spiky compositions speaking to the rectangular edges of the frame. Branches and stalks at jaunty angles are boxed in by it. And meanwhile, the compliant blooms are uh, slightly tipped towards the picture plane on display. Leaf eight depicts an arching pale pink lily stem. Dark, inky composite strokes capture the outlines and springy forms, the deep, verdant hues and waxy textures of leaves and stalks. And here you've got a complex tone and color loading of the brush so that a single in integrated stroke produces this idiosyncratic half blend of colors and shades. Note also the modulated, softer, prancing outlines of the main lily flower and the, and the faded backwash for the pale pink petals in contrast with the much more intense um, ochre and apple green of the sepals below which are overlaid with um, scumbled ink. The inscription elaborates on the scene with, nat uh, with narrative effect and synesthetic appeal. This flower mostly grows by the water's edge, he writes. Among the reeds, I picked this pure display 
to avail of its lonely fragrance later. So in lyric voice, the artist reveals how he supposedly plucked the stem from a water garden for a scented, pure display, Qinggong. And if this remark triggers our olfactory sense, or even in anticipation of it, it's because of a carefully confused looping of the sensory responses. The image becomes momentarily functionally real, even as its facture as a painting is underscored by the materiality of the album, the ragged individualist brush mode, and the lodging of poetic text in the picture's surface. So a quirky formal indexicality in dialogue with the virtual presence of the forms provides a measure of the painter as a scholar artist and also of his literary urban audience. So Puy's parting gift was treasured by Johnson, a committed royalist, but was it any more than just an old album of flowers? Let's take another leaf. The inscription here reads, amid the snow, a rosy fragrance reveals a precious pearl. So as before, the artist uses synesthetic images, snow white petals, a pink fragrance, a jewel amid the intangible, to commingle senses of touch, sight, and smell. Advanced epigraphic skill and poetic literacy are assumed here, but there's nothing out of the ordinary for anyone who had a mainstream education in late dynastic China, such as Pu Yi and Johnston. And anyway, here in the genre of pure display and in an imperial parting gift, we should hardly expect any really profound cryptic message. Yet such albums often did have key leaves or messages within them, and two of the leaves do seem to say more as instruments about the purport of the gift. One is the first leaf, the peony. O Pui's autobiography of 1964 is patently ghostwritten by a, a Communist Party hack. The remarks upon Johnston's learning and character and tastes do ring true. He was, wrote Pui, a connoisseur of Chinese poetry. I used to see him wagging his head as he chanted Tang poems, just like a Chinese teacher. And he was a lover of Chinese tea and peonies. Conventionally, the peony also stood for fortune and status. And for the royalists' pleasure, Pu Yi further added his imperial seal, that's the big one at the top, a Xuantong royal stamp. And it, uh, judging by the, the very messy impression, it, he probably did it himself. <laughs> the artist's inscription refers to an intimate friendship between two people, uh, neither of us needs to say a word for us to know each other's minds. This clearly was a very well-chosen personal gift. As to the second significant leaf, although the label on the flyleaf states that the album's undated, there is a date lurking here amid the uh, highly cursive inscriptions on leaf nine, the chrysanthemum. And appropriately, the date here is of the chrysanthemum festival when ancestors are honored. Now, the full inscription reads, Lu Fu's poetic emotion returns. Tao Qian's wine euphoria borrowed the year Xinyo, 1681, on the Double Yang Festival. Now, the Qing dynasty's heyday spanned the long 18th century. And for Pu Yi, who is positioned here in pink in Johnston's uh, pedigree of Manchu emperors in Twilight, Chen Shu's album was painted in the very year, 1681, usually marked as the start of this golden era, so in green, with the second founding of the Qing by the Kangxi Emperor, who reigned from 1662 to 1722, following the quelling of a long rebellion. And in 1926, living in exile in Tianjin under Japanese protection, or control, depending how you look at it, did this date, I wonder, somehow signal Pui's hope for a new beginning, for a post-Qing empire in the Manchurian homeland. And this is indeed what uh, Pui's Japanese backers created for, for him, with him as puppet emperor, uh, just six years later, as Johnston notes under Pui's name um, down here, ruler of Manchuria from 1932. Now, what about the Chrysanthemum Festival? This occasion is linked with the ancient poet and courtier Tao Qian, who famously quit court in uh, 405 to return to his country estate 
to cultivate chrysanthemums and drink wine. But at court, this was a tricky topic because Tao Qian had actually quit in disgust at court corruption and had composed an ode ever after celebrated as the classic of the demoted, exiled, or otherwise frustrated scholar official. So in a strategy mastered by his predecessors, Emperor Xuantong drained away the implied criticism from this illusion by gifting this object. Pui effectively gave his blessing to Johnston, his permission to quit court, to return to England on gardening leave. What else? Well, in art history, 1681 is also just four years before the creation, also in Nanjing, of this disturbingly modern masterpiece, 10,000 Ugly Ink Blots, by the great individualist painter Shi Tao. Now, Shi Tao admired Chen Shu's art, as we know from his remarks on a later album of landscapes. In the art canon, which I'm, I'll come to in a minute, Chen Shu is generally classed as a third tier painter. Yet here, Shi Tao praised him for achieving fame with his lofty antiquity. And in the company of far better known masters, uh, Kun San and uh, Chen Zhengkui. It's typical of Shi Tao's cross-grained, even modern thinking to shape a diachronic concept like lofty antiquity in terms of present agency. But it's also significant that in 1926, with the Chinese art world in a maelstrom of canonical transition, Shi Tao was himself emerging as a doyen of an expressionistic or sketch conceptualist, Xie Yi, lineage, the one that began with Xu Wei, uh, with also a modern following, sometimes called the New Progressive School, uh, Xin Jin Pai. For example, a young Tyro like Zhang Daqian exhibited this Shi Tao inspired landscape in China's first National Fine Arts Exhibition in 1929. Such works as this were much more in tune with global modernism than works by followers of the Qing Orthodox canon, known as the antiquarian school, Fu Gu Pai, which you might have expected uh, Pu Yi to have been a follower of. So how did the callow Pu Yi come to have in his possession an album by a painter admired by Shi Tao, hero of progressive young artists, when Pu Yi had been expelled from the Forbidden City in 1924? And to what degree was he even aware of these shifts in the art canon? I'll come back to that. In the summer of 1930, which was seen on both sides as the last parting, Pui presented Johnston with the folding fan. The painting uh, side shows a journey away from the capital, um, and this was probably a commission. But the inscriptions on the reverse wonders of PowerPoint, you see, turn it over, uh, were, however, penned by Pu Yi himself. And certainly you can say this on style, but also if you look at the layout of the two poems, you can see that the first one in green, uh, the road lead, leads ever onward, it comes as far as here, on this, uh, under, the, under the mouse arrow. And the second one, out of the city's eastern gate I go on foot, uh, is in, in the pink area here. It continues the format of 5-2 five, five format up to this line. Um, but suddenly, at this point, the calligrapher realizes, the evidently inexperienced calligrapher, realizes that he's going to run out of space and not have room for his dedication. So he switches to these tiny characters that you see here to cram the remains of the poem in. So it goes five two five two five two five two five zero oh. <laughs> eight three five one. <laughs> Touchingly, this is quite literally a schoolboy error in transcription. Yet it is for that, again, a highly personal gift, and one that opens up the question: Who was actually nostalgic about leaving China? Was it Johnston going to England, or Pui to Manchuria, or both? Now, how did Pu Yi come to have at hand such artworks as the album? Well, that's no secret. Inspired by Johnston's education, in 1922, Pu Yi and his brother, Pu Jie, determined to escape from the Forbidden City to study at Oxford. Only their escape attempt in 1923 failed when Pu Yi was double-crossed by eunuchs. Uh, Pu Yi wrote, quote, 
The first stage of our escape plan was to provide for our expenses. The way we did this was to move the most valuable pictures, calligraphy and antiques from the imperial collections out of the palace by pretending that I was giving them to Pu Jie and then store them in the house in Tianjin. Pu Jie, who came into the palace each day for lessons, used to take a large bundle home after school every day for six months. That's between autumn 1922 and spring 1923. Now, the extent of corruption among imperial household palace staff was such that the teens' takings was barely noticed. It was, in fact, unit graft that had already prompted the heads of the household department to begin making an inventory of the collections. And ironically, their lists enabled the brothers to choose, quote, the very highest grade of artworks. But this stocktake was also probably the cause of the infamous arson attack on the uh, Jianfugong Palace, a precinct in the northwest corner of the Forbidden City, on the night of June 27th, 1923, the fire set by eunuchs to cover their tracks. In the aftermath, Pu Yi tried hard to reorganize the palace, but it came to nothing. On the 5th of November, 1924, a pawn in North China's warlord rivalries Pui was expelled from the Forbidden City at gunpoint following a coup d'etat. In Pui's estimate in 1964, quote, we must have removed over 1,000 hand scrolls and more than 200 hanging scrolls and albums, and these were all taken to Tianjin, and later some dozens of them were sold. The rest were taken up to the northeast by the Kwantung army advisor Yoshioka after the foundation of Manchuk War and disappeared after the Japanese surrender, unquote. Here you get that um, kind of almost gleeful tone of the ghostwriter coming through, that kind of tone of delight in disaster that um, writers of inventories like this always seem to adopt when they enumerate the ill-gotten gains of disgraced leaders and politicians. Now, Pu Yi, having been reunited with his smuggled treasures in Tianjin, what did it mean to choose the album uh, by Chen Shu? Well, that prompts the question, what was the state of the art canon and the critical hierarchy of his tutors and advisors? And we can infer this from the personnel involved. The leading connoisseurs were the imperial tutor Chen Baochen, a noted antiquarian, and after the Jianfu Gong fire, a royalist called Zheng Xiaoxu, who had previously lived from selling his calligraphy in Beijing and who subsequently became Pu Yi's de facto court calligrapher. He, it was he that wrote the uh, preface for Twilight in the Forbidden City. So Johnson, Chen, and Zheng quickly became a triumvirate of loyal advisors to the young ex-emperor. Now Johnson's time as tutor to Pu Yi coincided with the first concerted moves in the New Republic towards modernization of society and culture. The use of nude models in the newly founded art academies sparked a furore in the media. And in 1919, the new culture movement Prompted edu promoted education reforms such as replacing classical Chinese with vernacular literature and brushes with fountain pens for writing. Meanwhile, advances in technology transformed print media, spurring the growth of public opinion informed by an illustrated press. And in this mix, an expressive masculine ink painting thrived in Beijing and Shanghai. The antiquarian scholar painter Wu Changshuo painted heartily up to his demise, aged 83 in 1927. And exemplifying the social mobility of the new republic was a peasant-born artist called Qi Bai Shi, famed in 1920s Beijing for his ragged brushwork, inventive design, see here the, the, uh, the layering and the framing, and his industry. He was made a professor in a new art academy in the late 1920s. Even as he supported a child bride in the provinces, a concubine in Beijing, and more than a dozen children by both of them. All of this coincided with the height of the warlord era in North China between 1926, 1916 and 28. Johnson remarks in Twilight that he was probably alone among Pu Yi's tutors in introducing him to the news. But what were Johnson's aesthetic credentials? Well, to explore this, let's consider the commemoration of events that turned Pu Yi's childhood world upside down. It's the 5th of November, 1924. The Forbidden City is surrounded by warlord troops. And given three hours to leave, Pu Yi temporarily 
takes refuge in his father's mansion north of the Forbidden City. For several weeks, rumor and civil war plotting swirl around the city. And then, aided by close advisors, including Johnson, Pui flees, concealed in a cart on the stormy 29th, to the safety of the Japanese legation in the foreign-controlled legation district just south of the Forbidden City. And he remains here under Minister Yoshizawa's protection until early 1925. Pui's escape across Beijing during the dust storm was commemorated in this painting scroll, assembled by Zheng Xiaoxu, reproduced in grainy half-tone in Johnston's memoir. In the title piece, inscribed with righteousness and dignity, Chen Bao Chen called the scroll painting a storm and a marvel, and appended a poem he wrote from it, from which Johnston took the English title, The Flight of the Dragon. Johnston's translation uh, below is below there. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. As to the painting, the short composition is anchored at the left end by wind-torn pine trees, traditional symbols of stalwart scholars, evidently referring to Zheng Chen and perhaps Johnston. And in the middle, seen through the dust storm over the outer walls of the Forbidden City, the palace rooftops all askew recede into the middle distance. And to the right, flying half-hidden in a swirling cloud of dust, is the young dragon, the escaping emperor, going off alone. Now, the abnormal effects include the disorienting left-to-right movement, the vertiginous looping of the composition, the disheveled pines and the rakish angling of buildings out of the orderly grid matrix of the city. With Zheng Xiaoxu as producer, this scroll variously embodies Chinese painting tradition, but in uncharted modern waters. It depicts the emperor and statesman engaged in affairs of state in Republican times, presented through the lyric voices of scholar officials. It evokes Qing court art in its collaborative production, but it has a contemporary look. And despite these continuities with the past, it's patently reflexive about its purpose as an emotive record of Qing deracination from the Forbidden City after 280 years. Now, Johnson was a China hand and close to Chen Bao Chen and Zheng Xiaoxu, but not, like them, an art connoisseur. And he either, either mistakenly or deliberately identified the painter as Zheng Xiaoxu, whose sobriquet was Su Kan. If this was a mistake, as I suppose, it was easily done. Chen Bao Chen's inscription says, Su Kan Zuo Hua, which in the bit in blue, which means literally Su Kan made this painting. Although in classical Chinese, it can also mean Su Kan had this painting made, which is what he meant. The signature on the painting is also confusing, particularly if Johnston had only a grainy photograph like this as a record. It, in fact, reads, uh, respectfully painted by Zheng Chang, Zheng Chang Gong Hui, and is penned in small formal script in a rather anachronistic formula. The third and fourth characters read Gong Hui, respectfully painted in the manner of artists at the Qing court. It was clearly a commission from a modern artist game enough to play the part of Qing court painter. And as to the artist's two-character name, the surname is the same as Zheng Xiaoxu's, while the second character, Chang, is not easily legible in the reproduction in Johnson's book. And it's possible never, Johnson never actually knew who this person was. And his confusion probably arose due to the fact that Zheng Xiaoxu was also famous as a painter of pines as well as a calligrapher. Johnston would have supposed, rightly, that Zheng could easily transpose strokes from calligraphy to paint pine trees, as all scholar artists could, the basic formula of his paintings backs that up. You see these partial cropped views of pines which foreground ink and brushwork techniques. But Zheng was not a painter of scenery like this, which required mastery of a much wider range of pictorial techniques, such as scale and depth, wash and texture, and a more complex composition and framing and iconological effects of mood and ambience. So the painting, uh, Flight of the Dragon, does have various characteristics of the early works of the young artist who signed it, Zheng Chang. Notably, the anchoring clump of trees in the lower left, which you could compare with this undated uh, painting, 
and a composition that ranges back into and across the picture frame, and also the gray wash of the sky, which serves equally well for the dust-strewn sky in Flight of the Dragon, as it does here in the moonlit skies seen through bared, bared branches, layered bare branches in Zheng Chang's Willow of 1926. And the signatures on these two paintings are very close, as you'd expect if they were more or less coeval. And as far as I know, The Flight of the Dragon has never been acknowledged as an early work by Zheng Chang. Now, Zheng Chang, also called Zheng Wuchang, was no ordinary painter, but by the mid-1920s was emerging as a leading artist of modern literati-style landscape, uh, having exhibited in the National Fine Arts Exhibition in 1929. He'd attended Beijing Normal University from 1915 to 1918, which is presumably when uh, Zheng Xiaoxu encountered him, but he spent most of his life from 1922 in Shanghai working in art publishing up to his death in 1952. And he was very close to other prominent artists like Zhang Datian. His magnum opus was a compilation, Zhongguo uh, Huaxue Quan Shi, a complete history of Chinese painting studies, published in 1929, the title of which featured a trendy neologism, Huaxue painting studies. Zheng Chang's book was graced with prefaces by three mavens of China's art world. Uh, Wu Changshuo contributed this title page on the left. Zheng Xiaoxu contributed a preface, dated 1927, and the painter Huang Binghong, another preface. Zheng Chang was a sociable creature. A portrait of Zheng Xiaoxu features in a hand scroll painting commissioned of him in 1930 to record a tea party there's the portrait right in the middle there. And he was evidently a sympathetic brush for Zheng Xiaoxu, one who completed plenty of transcriptions of old master paintings with a modern flourish, and who, in his own words, advocated, quote, studying painting not in order to take the past as one's teacher, but so as actually to eject oneself from the old master tradition, the Da Da, and becoming a master in one's own right by fusing reality with brush techniques of the ancients. That's actually not a bad description of Flight of the Dragon. But what can the figure of Zheng Chang tell us about the other paintings of concern tonight, in particular the value of our Chen Shu album? Well, in Zheng's history, Chen Shu is listed in the third string of painters in the genre of flowers, one of 30 who, quote, excelled either by dint of sheer industry or else free spiritedness, who essentially could all enliven with color and give life to fragrant flowers and were famous in their own time, unquote. To imagine the sheer industry mode, and this is a slightly pejorative term, consider two scrolls ascribed to Chen Shu in Taipei, intended for display at the Duanwu Festival, entitled Elegant Flowers of the Fifth Month. Like our album, dated to the double ninth, these belong in the type called pure display pictures, qingongtu, that is, elegant paintings made for festivals, like New Year's Day, or as here, the double fifth. Elsewhere in Zheng Chang's text, Chen Shu is recognized as famous in his time, but the praise is qualified. Quote, Mr. Chen's bird and flower, grass and insect paintings are reminiscent of the Ming painters Xu Wei and Chen Chen, that's a positive thing, though one may object to his brush and ink handling as too bright, be more tai guang, we might say too flashy, and to the lack of any distinctively untrammeled flavor, unquote. This is important as it elaborates up upon Chen Shu's other free-spirited mode exemplified by Johnson's album. This was in the same vein as the mid-Ming scholar painters Xu Wei, shown here, and Chen Chen, the demanding critic acknowledged that Chen Shu brought fragrant flowers to life, but he fell short in using flashy brushwork and displaying a certain lack of exceptional flavor, and it's hard to disagree. This is quite useful in gauging how the contextual value of Pu Yi's gift to Johnston was probably something above the artist's traditional third-tier status. We've seen how this free-spirited mode was quite fashionable in the 1920s. 
Zheng Chang's History of Chinese Painting Studies, which goes right up to 1929, provides more detail. His exemplar is the recently deceased Wu Changshuo, who had inscribed his title page. Wu is listed as the last of the top tier of Qing Dynasty painters. Quote, he paints flowers, bamboos, and rocks in an unaffected and light-hearted manner with vigor and archaism somewhere between Xu Wei and Bada Shanren. Indeed, he profoundly captures the spirit of metal and stone, that is, late Qing antiquarianism. Among modern scholars, he is the pinnacle of fashion, unquote. So on one side, Wu Changshuo is positioned as a torchbearer in art of the values of the late Qing intellectual movement referred to as the metal and stone studies or epigraphic studies movement, which is an antiquarian trend within the wider intellectual skepticism called the evidentiary scholarship movement, Kao Zheng Shu. You can therefore posit antiquarian works like uh, this one in which Wu Changshuo painted in the flowers and added an inscription on a sheet of paper that had previously been prepared with an ink rubbing by an artisanal specialist in this from an ancient bronze vessel and its inscription. Meantime, Wu Changshuo was heir to and exemplar of an invigorated individualist or conceptualist CAE lineage. See here a 1927 album leaf in Bada Shanren style. And his painting was visualized as situated among the early modern greats somewhere between these two 16th, 17th century masters, Xu Wei and Bada Shanren. There is here a palatable sense of the canon of art in transition as the politically curated Qing order was being dismantled and replaced by a non-denominational uh, set of masters with carefree, sketchy brushes. An expressive painting mode was being retroactively framed as core to scholar painting and the lineage proleptically founded by Xu Wei in the Ming and continued by Bada Shanren and Shi Tao in the Qing. And according to Zheng Chang, Wu Changshuo's art supremely exemplified this visual discourse of modern scholars within the 1920s ink painting fraternity. We now see the choice of the Chen Shu album in a new light. The standard criticism held him as a third tier artist, but of growing importance in the 1920s was the fact that he worked in this conceptualist ink mode and that he was a contemporary of and worked in a similar mode to the two, two emerging greats of this lineage, Bada Shanren and Shi Tao. So the album commemorates past personal and courtly relationships between emperor and tutor, but it also has this new progressive quality of the 1920s, which speaks, of, as we've seen, in particular to Zheng Xiaoxu's artistic network. We'll never know if Chen Baochen or Zheng Xiaoxu did pick out this album for Pu Yi, but what seemed at first like a simple memento selected from Pu Yi's teenage art trove actually opens up the complexity of Republican China's confused art world, of politics in turmoil, of a canon in transition, and even of the validity of obsolescing royalist codes in shaping reactions to events and desires for the future. So as now cares for these two gifts, the fan and the album, and rightly sees them as embodying its institutional connection with Sir Reginald Johnston and his service to Pu Yi. Do be sure to have a look at them later in the Brunei Gallery. As for the flight of the dragon, who knows if it survives? After 1949, neither the Chinese communists, nor the ousted nationalists, nor Japan under its new constitution had much reason to cherish Pu Yi and his courtiers who made it, as their reputation became enmeshed in the legacy of ambition and conflict in early 20th century East Asia. Uh, dear colleagues, Friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor 
and privilege to be allowed to say a few words of thanks on all our behalfs to Professor Shane McCausland for what was a typically erudite, stimulating, and original lecture. To his many achievements as a scholar of the transnational art world of Yuan Dynasty China, he's now clearly opening up important new avenues of research into the transnational art world of China's 20th century, and we will all have much to learn from this. It's also a great pleasure to be able to celebrate the new agreement between the school and the Percival David Foundation, and at the same time to welcome Shane into the Percival David Chair of the History of Art. So I'm very conscious now that the longer I go on, the less time there is to look at the art that we've just had so entertainingly introduced to us, and so I need to be brief. <coughs> Professor McCausland and I are both graduates of the University of Cambridge, where we both got our introduction to Chinese language and culture, and I remain very grateful to it, even if I now make my living at the other place. Um, but it has its little ways. And so I offer an anecdote which, and you'll need to bear with me on this, does, I believe, have a real a bearing on what we've heard tonight. So 45 years ago this year, on arriving at Cambridge and going for the first time to meet my director of studies, a very distinguished professor, a translator of Persian poetry, I was literally amazed to be introduced by him to Sir Stephen Runciman. Runciman was the hugely renowned historian of Byzantium, whose history of the Crusades I had read and revered at school. So meeting this great man was like being introduced to Edward Gibbon or, or Suma Tien. The idea that he was really in the same room as me was, as I say, amazing. <coughs> so in the kind of upper-class pre-war accent I wasn't then much used to, he said, ah, you are studying Chinese. It may interest you to know that I once played four-handed piano duets with the last emperor of China. <laughs> now, given that I, a 17-year-old grammar school boy from Aberdeen, had a somewhat more restricted social circle, uh, no witty repost came to my lips. Um, but I have enjoyed telling this story many times in my life, given that it puts me at only one di degree of separation from Pu Yi himself, that, that close to the dragon throne. <laughs> However, a recent and exhaustive biography of Stephen Runciman reveals not only that he seems to have made this claim and told this story to everybody he met, um, but that it isn't true. Um, <laughs> Uh, he did indeed come to know Reginald Johnson in the course of a grand tour which took him to China in 1925, but meticulous research by his biographer reveals that he never in fact met Puyi at all, never mind tinkling the ivories together. It was a myth, or uh, less kindly, a lie. So now I'd like to invoke a figure from Shane's other great alma mater, Princeton University, where Harry G. Frankfurt taught philosophy with immense distinction from 1990 to 2002. In 2005, he published the short and uncannily prescient book On Bullshit, a serious work, despite its title, where he defines his topic as, quote, speech intended to persuade without regard for truth. <laughs> the liar cares about the truth and tries to hide it. But the bullshitter is both more dangerous and more morally wrong than the liar in that they don't really care whether what they say is true or false as long as it has the desired rhetorical effect. I'd now put Stephen Runciman in that category, <laughs> at least as regards his encounter with the last emperor of China. The mystique of the fallen empire, often involving alluring tales about the imperial collections, these, I suggest, have been immensely productive of bullshit in the study of Chinese art, a field which in general has perhaps seen enough of that commodity. So, to hear the lecture we have just heard, blending care and imagination into the best kind of scholarly bullshit direct detector is a great intellectual treat and an index of work at the highest international quality. In fact, Let's face it, there has been, and sadly still is, a lot of bullshit talked about China in the wider world. 
misinformation, which isn't quite lies, but which cares too little for canons of evidence or proof, and is content to tell stories rather than ask questions. That's why the kind of rigorous scholarship we've been privileged to witness tonight, firmly grounded in both linguistic and disciplinary skills of the highest order, is so important. This school has a great record to uphold, and after tonight, we can be in no doubt that, as Percival David, Professor of the History of Art, Shane McCausland will uphold it with great distinction and in full measure. So I ask you to join me again in congratulating and thanking him once more.